right, this week's mini lecture is about data management. So how do we manage all of our data involved in our meta-analysis project? And how do we make it manageable? So we're going to actually be focusing on three different levels of data. So the first part of this is going to be about how to manage your bibliography. The second part is going to be about how to manage your data. And then the last part will be how to manage all of the files that you end up with with a project, with a group project this size as well. And these slides for the PowerPoint in general are not sufficient enough to just look through them. You will definitely want to watch this mini lecture video in full because I'm going to give you some demonstrations and walk you through what you need to do to use these programs. And I'm going to be going over some of the tips and tricks that I use in order to uh, use these programs. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is how do you deal with all of the references that you end up with? And, you know, when we're doing a huge meta analysis, you end up with a large amount of data and you've got to come up with a way to organize that that is manageable. And it can be really challenging to get everybody on the same page with how you organize that information, how you access it, and how you pull it from the different sources and databases that you're using. And so I'm going to teach you a really slick way that can help you do that as a group in a way that does not suck a lot of your time. All right. Um, you'll actually save hours of your life that you would never otherwise get back if you follow these tricks. So uh, may want to pay attention to this one. Um, think about it too, you know, remember when we were doing the literature search discussion forum and we were trying to come up with, you know, what's the right formula of the comprehensive terms that we need to come up with in order to get, you know, the, the right amount of articles kicked back that should be getting us everything that we need that's published unpublished, what have you, for that particular meta, so we're not missing anything. And you know in that process, inevitably, even with the best keywords that we end up using, we're still going to get information that doesn't meet the pile. There's going to be some that meet exclusion criteria. There's going to be some that have nothing to do with our topic, just because that's how sensitive these search engines are. We want them to be that sensitive in some regard, because we really don't want to miss stuff. But that makes it a little bit more challenging for us because then we need to be really organized in how we sift through that information and how we keep track of what we did in what we kept and what we didn't keep and why we didn't keep it. All right, so I'm going to help you with some, some key skills that will help you with these programs to paring down that information when we're looking at it all. So remember we have a three-tiered process. First we're looking at the lit search that we get kicked back. We're going to get a lot of false positives in that, but we have our system systematized process that we use with meta-analysis for screening articles, right? So we first check it out at the title level. If we're not sure, we then look at the abstract level. And then if we think it meets criteria for the most part, we then are are looking at it at the full text level, so we're coding it. But in order to look at all this information, we've got to be able to go back after the fact that we've done all of this and look at all the articles that we didn't include because we need to be able to write that up in our methods section in our paper and outline, okay, we included 300 articles and we excluded 500. And of the 500 that were excluded, we need to be able to list the reason as to why the articles were excluded. And so we're going to come up with codes for different categories of why an article might not fit our meta criteria. And so we're going to keep it all organized. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a quick minute. And so in order to get to that point, 
the first step of that is really getting a reference manager program that's really helpful to you. And just as a quick heads up, all the programs that I'm talking about are free. I think it's very important to recognize, you know, when you don't need to spend money, don't. Um, I like to use programs that are easy to use, accessible, and, you know, of course, free. So um, these are great programs. I would recommend them um, regardless. So Zotero, it's free. It can be accessed by a group, so you can actually create a group account and access it, all of you. So it's very useful in that regard as well. Traditionally, it uses a Firefox browser, which is also free, but within the last few years, they have updated and they've also included Google Chrome. So that's what I'm actually going to demonstrate for you today is showing you the, the plugin for Zotero in the Google Chrome browser. That's just the browser that I use all the time, uh, but you can use Firefox if, if you prefer that browser as well. Um, and once you download Zotero and, and get it going, it, it's pretty easy to set up on your computer in about 20 minutes. But one of the really nice features of why you'd want to download and use this program, so what does it do? It's a reference manager. Okay, like what does that mean? It is going to allow you to import your citations that you're looking at in EBSCOhost into Zotero so that you can look at it there. And then it's also going to allow you to create an APA formatted reference list from those references too, which is pretty cool. So um, let me show you. All right, so this, oops, I'm gonna clear out my folder really quick. So this is Zotero, all right? You've got your library here. You'll see that citations will go in here. And I'm actually going to take you to the library's website. So https colon slash slash library dot alliance dot edu. And we're going to go to databases, EBSCOhost, and we're going to put in my information. We're going to select all the databases and here is the normal screen for EBSCOhost that we're used to looking at. And I'm actually going to encourage you to create an EBSCOhost account if you've never done that. Why? What's the benefit of doing that? Well, let me show you. All right, so we're going to sign in using my information. Um, you can click that sign up button there if you have not ever created an account, but I will show you why you definitely want to do that. So once you're signed in, you can see my name is up there. So we're in my account. And you'll see that you have a folder here. All right, and so your folder can actually keep track of things that you've been searching for. And let's say that you don't have all the time in the world that you need to sort of complete these search tasks in a piecemeal format. So you've got a couple hours here, 30 minutes there, what have you. Having an account and having a folder is really going to be beneficial here because this saves all of your search history in what you're doing if you put it in your folder. So you can see my folder has some stuff in it right now, but I'm going to clear it out for the purposes of demonstrating this to you guys. So here's my folder. It's empty. So we're going to go back to the main page and 
I'm just going to show you how to pull articles and put them in your folder. So I'm just going to search to pull up some articles here. Again, the search terms that I'm going to type in are not reflective of what you should be typing in to pull back your articles. It should be very comprehensive in what you're searching for. But one of the running examples is hypnotherapy and PTSD. So looking at the effectiveness of hypnotherapy with individuals who present with PTSD. So if, if this was our topic for a meta-analysis, let's say that we're looking at articles like this. So we end up with a search result of 409 articles. And let's say that I want to pull those articles and put them in my folder. So today we're just going to pull five just so that I can show you guys what this looks like with a little stack of data. Do you see <clears throat> this little blue folder here that has a plus sign on it? This is activated when you're signed into your account and in order to put it in your folder all you have to do is click right there on that blue folder and you see how it changes and it looks like there's a little piece of paper in it and if you go up to the top you can now see that your folder looks like it has pages in it all right so we're just gonna pull the first five that we see here on this list just so that I can show you what it looks like when there is stuff in your folder all right so we've got five there so let's check it out in the folder and here they are look at that <laughs> so really cool um, again let's say that you started pulling stuff you had to go away it's still gonna be here in your folder when you get back and that's what's great about it and the folder is also pretty cool because you can also email yourself a PDF copy of all of your articles that you've pulled so just having an account in EBSCO is really really nice and just saves you a lot of time it's very very helpful so now that we've got all this information here in our folder let's say that we are now in the process of wanting to put this stuff into uh, Zotero so we're gonna pull all five of them so we're gonna hit select all and over on the right hand side you're gonna look for the export button you'll see that it's here the very last button there so we're gonna hit export and you'll see here on the screen in the export manager that it's saying number of items to be saved five yep we pulled five articles and we actually want to pull from this item here in the middle citations in bib text format what is bib text I will show you alright so citations in bib text format and hit save and essentially what that does is it pulls up a page it shows you how many articles so five so you can double check that you got all that you were pulling and look at this it has all sorts of information on here and for lack of a better term it's a ton of crap so you've got the abstract data the title the authors the journal name, the keywords, the page numbers, you name it, the information about that article is there. <clears throat> and so how do we import that over into Zotero? So you're going to want to you're going to want to actually have your Zotero program minimized there while we're doing this. But you want to start by highlighting the word references, okay? And then going all the way down to the bottom of the page and ending at that last bracket there and just hit control C all right that puts it on your clipboard you're good to go then you want to go into Zotero you want to go to file and then import from clipboard give it a minute <laughs> And check it out they are all there so it actually tabulates them so that you can tell each journal article has a separate line there and let's just check it out so you've got your first article here you click on it you can go over on the right hand side and you can see all of those details 
related to that article. You can get a quick scan of what the article is about by looking at the abstract. You can find the authors, whatnot. If you've got any notes that you want to add about that article or anything like that, you can add notes to it as well. But you're able to click on each one and it gives you that information about it. All right, so now once you've got all your information into Zotero, let's say that you want to create your reference list, right? So you want to go to Edit and select All. So now you've got all of your articles that are highlighted there, okay? And you want to right click and come down to Create Bibliography from Items. All right. <laughs> Look at that. So the reason why I'm laughing is because, um, as you know, we are so lucky that APA decides to update the publication manual every so many years, and we have to buy the new one, and we have to learn all the new rules, and then we have to spend hours converting our Vita with our citations from the previous format to the new format of the publication manual. So look at that. Zotero is up to date. They've even got the seventh edition, which is the current edition that's out right now. So we can save some time and select the seventh edition there because that's the format that we want to put these citations in. We're going to also choose the output mode as bibliography and we want the output method as copy to clipboard. So we're going to hit OK. And we're just going to bring up a Word doc. So once we get in a Word doc, we're going to paste that info there. And there it is. Check it out. Pretty slick. And you'll notice that there's a space between each reference, which is awesome. I will say that you need to be mindful and you've got to have a critical eye because about, you know, there, there are going to be errors. About 85% of the data that gets kicked out of here is going to be accurate, but there are going to be some abbreviations and mistakes. So you are going to want to check this information that gets spit out. I would never submit this directly on a paper or to a publication without first reviewing it and editing that reference list. But for the most part, it's going to be pretty solid. Um, one of the things that you're going to notice is sometimes it will abbreviate journals. So it might say like uh, J of Counseling Psych instead of Journal of Counseling Psychology. So again, just remember to have that critical eye, look through your list, and make sure that everything is cited properly. So now that we're in a Word doc and we have a number of references up, this can also serve another interesting purpose for keeping track of all of your studies. And so let's put this into a table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all the references and I'm going to go insert table and then I'm going to do convert text to table and I'm actually going to select separate text at paragraphs and hit OK. And there, it's already created a table, and what it did is it separated by each citation because there was a space, and it recognizes that as a paragraph, and so it very, very quickly creates a table for us. And so, in addition to that, I'm going to insert a couple of columns to the left of here, and I'm going to adjust the size of these columns so that they're a little bit more workable for what we're looking at. And also I'm going to switch this to a landscape orientation. All right. And what these columns can really help us with is 
The first column we're going to use is our ID number. So whatever schema your group comes up with for your article numbers, you want to put that on the left hand side there. And then this column is a helpful way to keep track of articles that you did end up using versus uh, excluded from your meta-analysis and you want to track the reason as to why so that when it comes time to write up your method you've got all that data here in a Word doc and you can organize it. Alright, so let's just say we're just looking at these titles and I'm just hypothetically speaking here. Let's say that we used this article we also used this article we used this one let's say we didn't use this one and the reason was it wasn't research so let's say it was like theory based or something like that and let's say that we didn't use this one either and let's say there was no effect size data in it or, or whatever the reason might be whatever your exclusion criteria are and so that's a great way to keep track of your data when you've got a massive amount of citations and you need to be able to track what you did use and what you didn't use there and the reason this is also helpful with a lot of references is so that your group is working from the same list of articles. So you've got one master list, you've got them all numbered, so each article has its own number, so that whenever you do come across duplications, uh, you know, duplicates in the databases, which will inevitably happen, you can identify those and fix the numbering scheme and clean that data up and you can also split up the coding pretty easily. So you can say, you know, articles 1 through 200, I'll take. Articles 201 through 400, those are Sam's. Articles 401 through 600, those are Trisha's. Um, and so that's how you can really stay organized as a group in this way. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is organizing your data. And I'm really only going to focus on talking about Excel because this is a program that most people have it, most people know how to use it, it's very user friendly, you're able to import your data into other programs very easily, one of which we will be using, CMA, Comprehensive Meta Analysis, and it's also pretty easy to use with SPSS, which is also widely used in graduate school programs. So Excel is where we're going to stick to and, and talk about that for your data management. It does have a gentle learning curve, but it's not too hard to learn how to do some tricks and things in there. You won't have to know a lot of information in order to enter your data. The one con that I will mention about Excel that you need to be mindful of is you know when you are creating a database with Excel there isn't much inherent structure that it provides you so it doesn't really limit you and in that instance you can end up creating very unwieldy databases <laughs> that can end up being quite difficult to deal with. So you want to make sure that when you do create your database, you create a logical structure and you try to keep it as simple as possible so that you don't end up with an unwieldy structure to that. And with that, I'll pop over to Excel and I will show you guys what I'm talking about. So here is the database that you're, you know, this is the template sample that you're going to download from the module this week. But this is essentially the simplicity of your data entry. All right, so this is going to be your master database that your group is going to work from to enter your data. And you're going to be creating your database, all right, with just these fields to start with, but you're not actually going to enter any of your data until after you've coded all of your articles and after you've had your iterator meeting 
where you fight it out over which code is the final code and you determine those final codes. Final codes is what gets entered into your master database. All right, so now we're just learning how to set up the database. So in order to do that, you'll notice here that I've got a bunch of colors here at the top. You don't have to use these colors I've got, but I do want you to follow a color coding scheme because it'll really keep you organized in a couple of ways. Not only will it help you keep organized in terms of the data that you're entering into each field, um, but it'll also keep your mind organized when you're entering in your data and you may sort of, uh, it'll help avoid errors in data entry, which, you know, is always a possibility with human error. All right. So the easiest thing to do is just pull out your coding manual and just enter in your variables in order that they appear in your manual. That's the easiest way to do data entry, right? And you'll notice here that the titles of each variable that I've got here are all in caps and there's no space between words, or if there is a space, it's got an underscore instead of a true space. This is the format that variables have to be named in within CMA. And so to save us time later with data importing, if we do that here, we don't have to worry about that in CMA. So this is the format that we're gonna be using. So try to create a um, variable name that you know follows what that variable is so that you can tell what it is and you can differentiate it if you have a couple of variables that are similar and type that there in all caps if you do want a space to help readability a little bit you can use an underscore there and so you'll see like you know most of you will have uh, report type you know article type characteristics at the top of your coding manual, so you'll be including those codes. So just group those codes as one color. So study ID, author, pub year, uh, pub type, things like that um, under that first category. Then you'll move on to you know whatever your next category is. It might be what your treatment assignment variables are, your treatment uh, information, description about what treatment was. Um, your participant and measurement, your participant characteristics, your measurement characteristics, and then you've got your outcome and effect size data, right? And you'll notice here that I've got, you know, examples of <clears throat> data that you would need for a standardized mean difference, data that you would need if you were doing an odds ratio, and then data that you would need if you were doing a correlational study, all right? So whichever effect size your group needs, that's the data that you'll use. Delete the other fields if you're not using that effect size data so that this database only has the information in it that you absolutely need. You'll notice there's a second notes tab in here. This just gives you some helpful hints to follow that I've already talked about on the other slide, but it just reminds you of those things that you want to be mindful of when creating your database. And there you have it. All right. So Lastly, let's pop back in here and talk about managing files. All right, so as far as sharing files goes, <clears throat> really any sort of cloud server is going to work just fine when you're trying to work across a group. And I'm going to talk about two main uh, clouds that are used in grad school. The first of which was around, and it was very popular when I was in graduate school, Dropbox. Um, you will notice here in a moment that I'm not going to recommend that you use Dropbox, <laughs> but but I will talk about it because it's, it's possible that a lot of you are already using Dropbox. I, I'm not sure what's being recommended nowadays, but I'm gonna tell you why I don't go with Dropbox anymore. Um, but here goes. Dropbox is free. You get up to two gigs to start out with. It does sync your data automatically. What you will notice is that, you know, in order to see the automatic data, you've got to be logged in on the website. 
when you've got the downloaded desktop folder, it takes a while for that folder to sync with everything else. So even though the information syncs automatically in Dropbox, it does take some time, sometimes hours, for your desktop to sync with what's in your Dropbox folder online. Um, so you do want to be mindful of that if you're using Dropbox and sort of wondering what's the lag with what's going on with the lag there. It does save previous versions. So whenever you save over something, you can search for the previous version of that document if you want. You're able to share information easily. And one of, <laughs> one of the biggest reasons that I have for not using Dropbox, um, I just, I get heated when I think about this. I wasted hours of my life in graduate school because I did not know this about Dropbox. This was just the cloud that everybody used at that point in time. And <clears throat> so let me describe to you a scenario and how it goes down. <laughs> All right. Um, let's say that you're working in a group and you all have a deadline that you're working towards. And all of you has uh, individual tasks that you must complete to bring the work group together, right? And you don't know each other's schedules. You, you wouldn't want to know what everybody's doing. You've just got to manage your own stuff, right? And so let's just say that uh, two group members end up working on their stuff at the same time. And they've actually got to work in the same document to do that. So what happens if you're doing that when you're in Dropbox? Well, uh, let's say person A opens up the file and is starting to work on it and what have you. They save it. When they save it, it gets saved in Dropbox as the same original you know, title of what the document was when it was opened. Let's say person B comes in, I don't know, three minutes later than person A and starts working on it. When they save it, it actually ends up saving as a conflicted copy of that document. So now you've got two documents that are the same, but clearly there's a conflicted copy. So when you end up looking at those two copies, they're, they're different because one of them saves one person's work and the other one saves the other person's work. And it takes forever to figure out what is different within these two copies and it is an absolute absolute nightmare okay you just you don't want to experience this if you have i am incredibly sorry and i empathize because i i know what that is like and so here here is my pitch to you um after i discovered google drive life was just amazing for group projects this is the cloud that I'm going to fully endorse, and here's why. It coincides with your Gmail account, so even if you don't have one, it's free. You can create a Gmail, but every Gmail account that you create, you will have a Google Drive associated with that Gmail account, so it's pretty slick. You can get up to 15 gigabytes free, which is a lot much bigger than Dropbox. Um, and it actually does have instantaneous upload and sharing of documents, not like the lag that you sometimes experience with Dropbox for hours if you're just using the desktop folder version and not logging in. And what I mean by instantaneous, I mean instantaneous. I have been in research calls where we are working on a common document and we don't have good bandwidth so we can't share the screen to show everybody what we're working on. And, you know, a colleague will say, you know, okay, I've finished the cover letter for the journal, log in, check it out. I've just uploaded it. I hit the refresh button. It is instantaneously there. So it is absolutely hands down amazing. Uh, it will not fail you and it does not create conflicted copies either. So that is another fantastic reason to um, go with Google Drive. 
All right. The last thing I'm going to show you is the coding schedule that you're going to be looking at this week. All right. So most of you are in a team of three. We do have one team of four, so I'm gonna pull that up really quick and show you what that one looks like too. So here's the team of four, but both of these coding schedules are on the within the module for you to download. All right, and I'm just gonna demonstrate on the team of three here. But it provides you with some instructions, but this is your schedule to keep all of your articles organized within your group. All right, so you're able to identify who your coders are and what articles you are responsible for, both as the initial coder and as the blind coder. All right, so let's say that I am coder one. So we're going to go in and put that there, and you'll see that I'm green. All right, so I'm responsible for the first five articles all right and let's say that coder 2 is Sam he's blue so he's responsible for articles 5 through 10 and then we've got our coder 3 which is Trisha, and she is responsible for articles 10 through 15. All right, so this, right off the bat, you know who's got what for your initial articles. And then you would go ahead and fill in over here who's blind coding what. So Sam would end up coding, blind coding articles one and two and then articles 13 through 15. And then Trisha is going to end up coding articles 3 through 7. And then I'm going to end up coding articles 8 through 12. All right. And this is really as simple as it is. All right. So you'll need to just come up with your article ID number. So the schema that you guys want to follow there under here, you can do one, two, three, you know, however you want to do that and then just include your citations here in the middle and then these are the instructions that are provided to you so basically just remembering that blind coding is blind uh, not uh, taking not not using the temptation to look at the initial coders coding and, and truly code that blind so that you can establish generator reliability and that's that so that's this week's mini lecture and Good luck getting organized, guys.